Betsy. Thank you, Casey. It's fabulous to be here, fabulous to uh, be sharing in this service and to be a part of worship with you. For those of you who don't know what Jesus the Game Changer is, I'm just going to give you a quick uh, background to it, and then we're going to talk about it. Uh, and I know you're doing it as a, as a, uh, through your small groups, but I brought some stock this morning. It's no big deal, if, but if you feel like this is helpful for you or somebody that you know, that you can grab that, and we've got it obviously at cheaper prices than normal. So it's, it's a 10-part DVD, 28 minutes apart and, and 10 episodes. Now, if you don't remember the last time you saw a DVD player, uh, you can actually go online, but it's slightly more expensive and a little more complicated, but you can go online and buy uh, a, a, the fact that you can get onto a Vimeo and a permanent stream of Vimeo. You can't download it, but you can get a permanent stream of Vimeo as you would with a lot of other iTunes and Net, Netflix uh, use so that's the series, but you can get it as a DVD and you can go home and find your DVD player. Uh, there's also a study guide and uh, pen and paper, remember that? So it uh, comes as a study guide. And if you love pen and paper, as my wife does, you'll, uh, you'll want to get the study guide as well, which goes with it. But for those of you uh, who prefer the technology side of it, it's actually available as an app. So you can go and it's totally free. Jesus is the Game Changer on iTunes or Google Play. Download it onto your phone, uh, Android or um, Apple, and uh, you can get the whole app. It's got links to Bible Gateway. It's got places you can write notes. And it's actually uh, on the app, which it doesn't have anywhere else. There's actually background to all of the guests. So you can, you can look at the background of the guests and links to what they have, they're doing, because we don't actually introduce the guests on the series, because there's 30 guests and it'll take too long, and we don't have it anywhere else. So that's where you can go as well. Uh, on the, on, as a matter of interest, I, I don't mention this, but I'll mention this to you guys. On, on our website, if you go to JesusTheGameChanger.com website, there are 12 full interviews that you can watch. So 12 of the better known guests on the series, we have their whole interview. And again, you can just go on the website and just watch that. So if you're really interested in Rodney Stark or John Ortberg or Christine Kane or a number of the other guests, their, their full interview is, is there for you to watch if you, if you would like. The newest thing that we've got, and this is only about four weeks old, and it's actually my wife's work, is actually the book of the series. This is a very expensive evangelistic tract. Uh, and I know it's a little solid, and it's not the sort of thing that you'll carry around in your pocket. But it is the opportunity to leave around. So if you, have a, a, if you work in a place that has a waiting room and you have some say in what goes in the waiting room, it could be really helpful. It's all of the content of the series. Uh, we worked with a, a, a author in New, New Zealand to develop that. Uh, it's got a whole bunch of photos, backgrounds, um, and all these photos are my wife's photos. She's got a great eye, wonderful photographer. Um, gift for somebody, uh, it, it's a great opportunity because you can look, flick through it and just see quotes. Uh, but you, if you want to, if you want to read the content of the series, the content of the series is available as well. So that's that's ways that you can use the series. And the reason I talk about that with you this morning is to say that our go our aim, our goal, uh, our outcome for this series is that people would be influenced for Jesus in the kingdom of God. And the only way that happens is if they see it or they get in contact with it or they engage with the content of the series. And one of the, the drivers of doing this series is the question, is a religion a force for good? So here we are at church, Sunday morning, a reasonably nice day in Adelaide, uh, footy on this afternoon, and you're kind of going, well, if re religion wasn't a force for good, I wouldn't be here. Uh, if Christianity was not a, a helpful force within the world, I wouldn't be here. Of course, religion is a force for good, except that is actually a question at the moment. There's a lot of people asking the question, is religion a force for good? Now, you're probably thinking, well, there's some others that, that, that aren't so much a force for good, but we certainly are. The trouble is we get kind of lumped into the same group. There's a group called Ipsos Polling. You'll know that name because they, Ipsos Polling um, is often, does a lot of polling around elections, etc. And Ipsos Polling did an international poll a couple of years ago because there was a debate on about whether religion was a force for good. And when they were doing this kind of international poll, I think there were about 14,000 people across a number of countries, and there was a pretty simple question, is religion a force for good? And the answer came back across the globe, about 14 or so thousand people, 50% said yes and 50% said no. Now you're thinking, well, that's a fairly close thing, isn't it, 50%? Except keep in mind that in Arabic nations, 95% voted yes. So that when you got to Australia, it was only 35%. When you got to England, it was down to about 24%. When you're in Sweden, it was down to 19%. Only one in five people in Sweden believed that religion was, it was a force for good within our community. 
And, and the intriguing thing is that when you, when you start thinking that way, what we see happening around us is the outcome. And what we see is this idea that religion, faith in our world, specifically Christianity, needs to be taken out of the public square. It needs to be taken out of the public square of education or the public square of the university or the public square of the media or, or, or especially politics. Uh, you're supposed to leave your faith at the door of the cabinet room. And somehow that, that religion needs to be pulled out of the public square. In fact, Paul Kelly, who's a, a, a kind I think he's called an editor at large. He's a writer for the Australian um, newspaper. He wrote an article around these issues. It was released on, he put it was in the paper on the 8th of July this year. And basically he said, the goal of the progressives within our community, they call themselves the progressives, within our community is to actually we take religion out of the public square of, of human activity. And yet Jesus was and remains an enormously influential people e person, even though people are to believe this is a dangerous idea that should be taken out of the public square. There's a couple of guys who are computer scientists, Frank Ward and, and Stephen Skiena, who wrote this book called Who's Bigger? If you're really into computer science stuff, you might want to read the book. Uh, I, I've uh, read, the, uh, read some of the book. It, it's basically terribly boring after you get past the introduction because they explain how they get their results. And if you're a computer scientist, it's fantastic. Uh, but uh, everybody else, it's a little on the dull side. And, uh, but essentially, they're asking this question, who's bigger? Who's bigger in human history? Who's the most influential person in human history? And they were using computer scientists by able to analysing large databases, data sets, to kind of get an outcome. And the large data set they looked at was the English Wikipedia. So all the greats from the past and the presents are on English Wikipedia, uh, more than 500,000 people. And so they're looking at how big is that person's page, how long is the person's, uh, how often is it read, how often is it changed, how often is it referred, to and they kind of and they're also looking at the difference between gravitas and celebrity. So you, know, you can have great celebrity, but you may not have much gravitas, much influence. And so it wasn't just a simple, wasn't a simple process of trying to work out who they thought was most influential. And then they crossed across their research with other ways of doing similar research and found the, the, a, a fairly uh, similar outcomes. And essentially they got the top thousand, they got down to the top 10. And the number one most influential person in human history on these guys as computer scientists was Jesus of Nazareth. This was released in 2016. Jesus remains, in their, in their work, the most influential person in human history. Keep in mind, uh, we interviewed Stephen Skinner in, uh, in Central Park in New York. No, no, he, I think he's got Jewish background, but he's, he's not a committed you know, Jew. He's not a, a religious person in his world. He, he just, he's just a computer scientist looking at the data. And he says, the data says the most influential person is Jesus of Nazareth, which we, again, we're in church and we go, oh, of course he is. But when you consider what Jesus left at the point of his death, resurrection and ascension, you pick any of those points, what Jesus left wasn't very much. The fact that we're talking about this 2,000 years later, the fact that computer scientists on, on Wikipedia would come up with he's the most influential person in human history is enormous surprise when you consider what Jesus left. What did Jesus leave? When he actually left earth, what did he leave? Well, you're thinking, well, the Bible, the church. He, he didn't own any property. He didn't start an organisation. He didn't write anything. There were things written about him, but he didn't write anything. He didn't travel very far from here to maybe Victor Harbour and back. Not very, like really not very far. He didn't speak to many people. You're thinking, well, you know, he spoke to, there were crowds, Carl, thousands in the crowd. Against human history, it was a proverbial drop, not just in the bucket, but in the ocean. Uh, he really didn't speak to many people and he didn't leave very much. I mean, they had a gathering of all the followers of Jesus in Acts chapter 1, verse 15, and there was 120 in the room. That's not exactly an enormous movement, is it? And yet here we are later, all these years later. And, and if you compared, say, Jesus of Nazareth to the ruler of the Roman Empire at that time, Caesar Augustus. Now, Caesar Augustus was the dictator, the ruler of the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire at that point of time stretched from what we would call Iraq today all the way through to southern England. 
So Palestine, Greece, Italy, Spain, southern, uh, southern France, all of that was all ruled by one guy. They built roads across that whole area so they could move their massive armies really quickly. Well, quickly then, not so quickly now, but quickly then. They were just all pervasive, all powerful. And you can't imagine, if you put those in today's terms about what that was worth, you couldn't number the billions of dollars that that was worth. And this is all run by one guy. And if you had a conversation around the time of Jesus' death or a few years later with a couple of people saying, now this conversation would never have happened, but just imagine if it did. Who do you think we'll be talking about in a few years' time? Caesar Augustus or Jesus of Nazareth? Who would have picked Jesus? Like, who would have picked Jesus? Nobody. There's a little phrase that's used, and I love this phrase. I wish it were mine. This is not mine. This is somebody else's. But these days, well, well, a generation ago we did. We call our kids these days really odd names. But uh, we used to call our kids Peter and John and Paul and Mary. And we call our dogs Caesar and Nero. It's just a small reflection of the shift in human history. And Jesus continues to be an enormously influential figure. And he's, he's influential in a way that we kind of miss. Because if you were to take Jesus out of human history, especially out of Western nations, you've got to ask what would be left. There's a guy called uh, Yuroslav Polak and has written a book called Jesus Through the Centuries. If this is an area of interest for you, you should read that book as long as uh, with a whole bunch of others. And Polakin says, if you had a magnet, I know this is odd, stay with me. If you had a magnet that you were able to hold over human history and that magnet had the ability to drag out of human history every piece of metal that had any relation to Jesus of Nazareth, anything in art, anything in in history, anything in teaching, anything in thinking, everything within human history. If If that magnet was to drag out of human history everything that had any relation to Jesus of Nazareth, what would be left? And if you don't know, the answer is not very much. Because Jesus is enormously pervasive in, and the early church enormously powerful. One of the, what, powerful in what it left and how it formed in human history. And that's the motivation for this series. This guy called uh, Alfred North Whitehead, who's a mathematician philosopher uh, from England in the early 19th century. And he wrote that in any particular period of time, what we often do is discuss ideas, like the major ideas, the, the kind of talking points, the, the places that we disagree in, in periods of time. He said, what we often do is discuss the ideas, the contentious issues. What we never discuss is the underlying assumptions that the whole is foundational for the whole community that only give us a certain number of ideas to discuss. He said, those underlying foundations, which we hardly ever talk about, they, were off, they have mostly been given to us by the life and teaching of Jesus in the early church. Now, some of you will be thinking, yes, I'm in church. I, I, yes, I know I should agree with you, but that sounds like a stretch. You need to do some reading. You need to do some thinking. You need to watch this series. Because what we're saying is the life and teaching of Jesus. This has enormous influence on the community and the values that we hold to, the underlying assumptions, the foundational ideas that drive Western democracies. You would have noticed one of the guys in the middle of that trailer, an older guy, his name's Rodney Stark. He's written 40 books. He teaches in sociology in Baylor University. He started is studying the influence of the church and the early church as a sociologist and a historian, not as a Christian or religious person at all. And you'll notice that his statement in the middle of that, in the middle of that trailer was, Western civilization would not exist if it wasn't for Jesus. And what we need to do is start to come to grips with the influence that Jesus had on our world. And I actually want to talk about two things this morning, two ways that Jesus had a huge influence. And the first is in the area of equality, that all people are equal. Now, given that we just had a short discussion before about the issue of supposedly marriage equality, it would sound like these things are in contradiction. In other words, I'm almost standing against equality, you might think. But let just hold that thought, I'll come back to it. But the equality of all people 
people is actually something that, that is a gift to Western democracies from the teaching of Jesus, Paul, St. Augustine, and the early church. You see, Jesus came into a society, and this is very hard for us to understand, that didn't believe that all people were equal, or all people had kind of equal worth and value as human beings. I mean, if we did a survey around this room or we gave you an assignment that says, go to the football, don't watch the game, walk around the crowd and, and ask strangers, don't do it because it's not socially acceptable, but ask strangers between pieces in the match, do you believe that all people have equal value and worth? And they'll all say yes. I, think you, I don't think you'll find a person who will say no, they don't. Now, here's the issue. Do we treat them with all value, equal value and worth? No, we don't. And there's all sorts of places we get that wrong. So the, the interesting thing is we live in a society where we believe one thing, but another thing actually seems to find itself out. And even in cultures that were ostensibly Christian cultures like England or America, if you watch that over the last another couple of hundred years, one was based on class, one was based often on segregation, they didn't live it out either. But this idea that people are of equal worth and value is, is it's something that we hold to as being the basis of our democracy was not something that was believed in Jesus' time. In fact, the great philosophers that often people look back on as saying formed much of our Western thinking, the people like Aristotle and Plato, etc., who was a, who was a student of Socrates, they didn't actually believe in equality. In fact, they believed that humanity was born or lived or a society was a, a natural inequality and that's the way it should be. That there's this massive slave class and that they were unequal to other, uh, to other people. In fact, Aristotle referred to, and you'll see on the, the series, slaves as anthropodon. A guy called James Orr talks about this. Anthropodon is a Greek word which means neither male nor female. It's like neuter. It's, it, you're, not, it, it's not, you're not really a person. Uh, Aristotle referred to slaves as like a living tool, something that you own and you use like any other tool or implement, but this is a living tool. Basically, they were seeing that these group of people were less than everybody else. And guess what? That's okay. If you go to Plato, he believed that women were, and wrote, that women were inferior to men in every way. They're inferior in, in, in uh, physically inferior, intellectually inferior, emotionally inferior, and because they're inferior in every way, they need to be treated as such, and that that was normal. Jewish men on a regular basis used to pray, Lord, I, I thank you that I wasn't born a Gentile, a slave, or a woman. And that was seen as a, a praiseworthy prayer. Why? Because they were less than you were as a male. This was not an equal society. And again, if you think, well, Carl, we've moved past that. We live in a society where everybody now believes everybody's equal across the world. Not so much. Have you been to India? Now, I'm not saying that, that India, India as a nation are terrible people who don't care for anybody within their nation. But you'll notice that at the beginning of the trailer, we had snake charmers. Uh, the snake charmers were there for two reasons. It's a very cool piece of footage and gets your attention. But it, it, there's, a, there's a kind of, there's a piece in that that you need to understand. The snake charmers have been snake charmers for generations. You know why they're snake charmers? Because it's the only job they can get. They don't, they're not, you, you would have heard about the, uh, the Brahmin down to the delete, the, the, the four or five um, areas, a strata of society. Well, what you don't, what I didn't know till I went to India and filmed this series is below the deletes, below the, the untouchables, there are, are basically hundreds, if not thousands of classes of people that fall outside the caste system. They have no rights. They don't have any birth certificates. They have less rights than animals. And, and essentially what they're saying is they fall outside the system. They are way less than everybody else. Now, if you think, about the, you think about the caste system, it's based on, I mean, obviously Hindu philosophy and whether you call it a religion or a philosophy, I don't really mind, but it's based on lots of obviously teaching, but two key tenets, karma and reincarnation. 
Reincarnation says that you, when you die, you just come back again, you can come back again. So death is sort of reduced in its importance because you're just going to come back anyway. Now, what you come back at is determined by karma. In other words, how you live this life determines what you'll be in the next life. So if you've been a good person, and remember this, good means different to what it means here. Being good means living out your space, your place, your caste, your spot in the system. And if you live that out well, you'll come back higher up. Now, if you think about, just logically, if you think about this through, if you are in the Brahman caste and you believe in karma and reincarnation, what do you think about your position? Well, you would, you would view it as total sense of entitlement, wouldn't you? I'm not sure what I did in the last life, but heck, it must have been good. Look where I sit. I don't know what you did in your past life, but boy, it must have been not so flash because look where you sit. And at its worst, and I'm not one casting dispersions across the whole Indian nation, I'm not saying that, but if you take the philosophy as it stands, at its worst, you don't actually help people further down the system because if you do, you're messing with their karma. They're working out their karma. You're working out your karma. You do good in your space in the world. And in that situation, if, if you, so therefore, equality in the, the all people are equal is not treated like that across the world. Into that world, the Greco-Roman world comes Jesus, who treats people with equality. Who, who ends up with Paul, who's often seen as a misogynist, who ends up writing that in Christ, when we're in Christ, he wrote to the church at Galatia, which is a large area, in Christ, there's neither Jew nor Gentile, there's neither slave nor free, there's neither male nor female, we are one in Christ. Here's this sense of we are one. And that oneness where Jesus treated everybody equally, and that comes through Paul, comes through Augustine, the early church, all of that is actually coming out of an Old Testament idea. And what's the Old Testament idea? That we're created in the image of God. The most brilliant and the most broken person stand equally before God. You know why? Because the spark of God is in us. And if you serve, as John Ortbergen says in our series, if you serve the most broken, the most needy and the most person in the world, there's dignity in that because that person is worth it. Everybody's worth it. Because not because of... If you, if you take a philosophy that follows evolution, that we're an accident of a whole bunch of accidental changes over billions of years, what do you get? Do you get equality out of that? Think about it. Logically, you don't. In fact, you get the opposite. What we, we, it is really the teaching of Jesus that says, the teaching of the Old Testament, the New Testament of Jesus and the early church that says... We have equal dignity and worth and value because we have the spark of God within each of us. Now, here's the kicker. All people are equal, but not all ideas are equal. All people are equal, but not what everybody teaches is the same. All people are equal, but what they, how they want to pursue their equality with other people and, and actions and, and morality and ethics, they're not all equal ideas. And we need not to fall for the fact that because we're all equal and equal dignity and worth that Jesus gives to us doesn't necessarily mean that we every idea pursued by an individual ought to be given the same amount of cred credibility. Leave that as a thought on the side. So Jesus gives equality of all people and Jesus comes and cares for individuals in a way that was quite new and radical in his world. The Greco-Roman world was not a ple pleasant place. The Greco-Roman world wasn't a nice place. It, wasn't a, it, it was not a good place to be born if you weren't in the elite and the powerful. In fact, you know, we love to go and see, you know, Russell Crowe doing his gladiator thing. We love that, don't we? Well, maybe it's just the blokes. You know, the whole kind of gladiator. We, we, you know, and we, we, don't, don't we sort of uh, make the whole gladiator picture so, look so good, don't we? Think about this. There is a group of people, a class of people, whose only job and existence in life is to walk into an arena in front of hundreds, if not thousands of people and kill each other for the entertainment of the crowd. And that's the only reason they existed. And you don't, you don't kill each other kind of euphemistically. You physically kill each other. 
And nobody sat there and thinking, is this a good idea that these guys kill themselves or kill each other for our entertainment? Nobody seemed to ask that. There was a sense that caring was not part of that community. Uh, let me quote two people who are not in our series. One, one is an a, a Australian uh, ancient historian, his, his name is Edward Judge, and Edward Judge is at Macquarie University, is an ancient historian. Edward Judge says this, classical philosophers regarded mercy, and then when we talk about classical philosophers, that, that kind of Greek philosophical cohort of people, classical philosophers regarded mercy and pity as, a, as pathological emotions, defects of character to be avoided by all rational people. That's what they believe about care. This guy called Tom Holland, who wrote a book, uh, uh, wrote an article last year. Tom Holland, if you watch the BBC and you're into ancient historian, uh, ancient history, you might know the name Tom Holland. He's written a couple of books about that particular period of time. He writes novels based around that period of time. And he's also done a bunch of BBC documentaries. I'm not sure what his worldview was, but he certainly wasn't a Christian. And uh, there was an article I was given when I was in the UK last year, which basically when we were releasing Jesus, is the game changer. They gave me uh, Justin Briley, who runs a radio show and premiere called Unbelievable, gave me this, this article said, this is, this is about to be released tomorrow, you should read it. And it was by Tom, Tom Holland in the New Statesman. And Tom Holland, this ancient historian, is basically, the, the, the article, which is quite short, is called, Why I Changed My Mind About Christianity. Now, this is important. He's not saying, I am now Christian. He's saying, why I changed my mind about Christianity. And he took a closer look at the Greco-Roman world that he loved and studied for years. And he said this as he looked at that Greco-Roman world. It, was just, it wasn't just the extremes of callousness that I came to find shocking, but the lack of the sense that the poor or the weak might have any intrinsic value at all. Here is a, a, a callous community that did not care for people. And then he thought about the history change over the next hundreds and several thousands of year, thousand years where the community started to care for people. And where did that come from? And here's what he wrote. Today, even as belief in God fades across the West, the, co the countries that were once collectively known as Christendom continue to bear the stamp of the two millennia old revolution that Christianity represents. In my morals and ethics, I have learned to accept that I am not Greek or Roman at all, but thoroughly and proudly Christian. Here's a guy who's an historian who looks at that world, looks at our world, and asks, how do we span those two? You know how we span it? Christianity. That's how we span it. I am thoroughly and proudly Christian. Now, whether he's saying I'm thoroughly and proudly Christian kind of in the values I hold, I don't think he's actually saying I am a Christian. He may well be. He's, he's not necessarily making that point. So what... What created this difference? Well, one of the places to look for that difference is actually found in Matthew chapter 25. In Matthew chapter 25, Jesus tells a parable. And we've got to understand this parable is not the whole gospel story because it sounds like in this parable that you earn your way to heaven. So I just want to say that as a caveat. And this parable, if you've been around church a while, you'll kind of know about this parable. It's where Jesus tells a parable of the end of time and all the world is stretched out in front of Jesus. All of humanity in front of the, well, not in front of Jesus, it's actually in front of the God who is judging all people. And as he's judging all people, he separates the sheep on the, his right to the goats on his left. Sheep on the right, goats on the left. So in this story, if you're a left-handed goat handler here this morning, you'll feel a little miffed. But that's what the point Jesus is making. Goats on the left, sheep on the right. And then he, then he says that the sheep are going to go into his eternal glory. And then he says, why? So he says, and the king will say to those on my right, come, you are blessed by my father. Take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. You've heard those words, haven't you? And Jesus, here's what the king says to the people who are about to go into God's eternal glory. 
And essentially what happens next, this is a loose interpretation, uh, what happens next is those are going into his eternal glory, about to head off sheep on the right into his eternal glory, and they stop and they turn back and say, you know, this is fantastic. We're really looking forward to getting your eternal glory. This is wonderful news. We're glad we're sheep on the right, not goats on the left. But just before we go in, just a small question before we go in, when exactly did we see you hungry, thirsty, naked, in prison? Because we, we reckon... We reckon we might have remembered. And we don't happen to remember seeing you like that. When did we do that? And Jesus said a set of words that changed the world, literally. Whatever you did to the least of these, my brethren, you did for me. And every person in the early church, or the majority of them, in the world that came, whenever something dreadful happened, remembered that Jesus said, we follow somebody that said, whatever you did to the least of these, you did for me. And Rodney Stark and others write about the fact that it was really, that was shown out enormously in 165 AD and 251 AD when there were two massive plagues across the Roman Empire. The plagues mostly hit in towns and you know, smaller gatherings. Uh, these plagues were so bad that between 25 and 30% of all the population were killed. I mean, can you imagine that? 25% of the population dying. And, and they had no idea what it was, no medicine except for really rudimentary ideas about what might be happening. And essentially, whenever, whenever it hit a town, everybody that could ran for the hills. The politicians ran, the, the pagan priests ran, the wealthy ran. If you couldn't run and somebody in your household was sick, you basically rolled them out in the street and left them to die. In that situation, who was it that changed? Who was it that stayed? The Christians stayed. The followers of Jesus stayed. The people who remember, they follow a guy that said, if you do this to the least of these, my brethren, you did this for me. And you know what happens? If people are sick and you feed them and, and give them something to drink and look after them, a lot of them get well. <laughs> but, but here is this notion that we should stay. We should look after people. We should care. And that's in a community that didn't. There's a guy called Julian the Apostate. How would you like to remember 2,000 years later as Julian the Apostate? He was a, a Roman empire, emperor that followed, kind of followed Constantine. He was Constantine's great nephew, I guess. He, Constantine, at, in 307 AD, changed the Roman Empire to be Christian. Constantine was a Christian of sorts, so there's some discussion about that, and made Christianity the, the religion of the Roman Empire. When Julian followed Constantine, he hated Christians. He hated the idea that that was happening, so he wanted to get rid of Christianity, but he also wanted you know, to lift up the whole pagan religion. And he said to the pagan priests, you've got to start looking after people. You've got to start hospitals, Zenodikia, these little hospitals for the, for the poor and the weak because the Christians are doing it. And the only reason they do it is to make us look bad and we do look bad. And you need to get out there and start doing it. And it never, but it never happened. They never did it. Why? Two reasons. One, Julian died. That's a drawback. <laughs> but secondly, the reason they didn't do it, because they didn't believe it. It wasn't a part of their construct. It wasn't a part of how they thought. And therefore, they didn't do it because they didn't believe it. The church in its caring for people, the monastic movement. You know, our trouble with Baptists, you know, my trouble as a Baptist, or a, as a, if I can make it more broadly than Baptist, non-Catholics, we tend to think that there was the three, first 300 years of the church, okay, and then nothing happened till 1517 when Martin Luther nailed the uh, theses on and the, Pro the Protestant Re Revolution sort of took off. And, and, and we start looking at history. You know, there's 1,200 years. A lot of stuff happened. Yuroslav Polakin said monks and monasteries won Europe for Jesus. You know what they also did? They cared for people. They started hospitals. They started schools. They changed the world. But one of, the one of the mistakes that you'll get out of, possibly you'll get out of this morning, is that you'll start to think, right, Jesus came to bring massive sociological shifts to the community, these massive foundational ideas which changed our community, and that's how Jesus is a game changer. And I want to say to you right now, that would be wrong. Jesus didn't come to make massive sociological changes. Jesus came to change one person at a time, one life at a time, one individual at a time. And you know what? When they were changed, they changed the world. 
Jesus didn't come to make big sociological changes. He came to call people to follow him. And as they did, they lived his life. And that's what changed the world. And the great people that made massive changes in the, that built our community, Western democratic nations, the way they are now, often were people that had their lives radically shifted by Jesus and they radically changed their world. One of the stories we tell is William Wilberforce is an enormous uh, hero of mine, and it's hard, hard not to be if you read about his life. Wilberforce, many of you might know that name. If you don't, you should look him up. Google him, not now. <laughs> Do it later. Um, uh, so Wilberforce actually was the, the driving force in the Commonwealth of Nations out of the British Parliament that abolished slavery across the world, and that's how he's remembered. But what you're going to remember about William Wilberforce is he grew up in a family. His dad died when he was only nine. His family were a, a business family from, uh, from uh, northern England. Uh, he went to Cambridge University. He's a brilliant young man. He's a bit, apparently, he's a bit of a weedy, sickly kid, but he was incredibly bright and loved by people, Just uh, but spent most of his time at university carousing, playing cards, staying out late at night, doing all the sorts of stuff that you probably shouldn't be doing when you're studying at university, or maybe that's... University. Anyway, he, um, he got through Cambridge. He, he, at 21, became the member of Hull. So at 21 years of age, he's the member of Hull and goes to Westminster in London to the Houses of Parliament. He's automatically, very quickly invited into five different private clubs, which apparently at the time was quite unique. He was the best mate of William Pitt. William Pitt's dad was the Prime Minister. William Pitt would become the Prime Minister. So here he is. He's in Parliament. He's, he's loved by people. He's in all these private clubs. He's a Member, he's a friend of one of the most powerful families in the, in, in the British Empire and in London. And in the middle of all that, he decides after a couple of years to do a grand tour of Europe. And uh, you do that in a horse and carriage. And so he was with his mother, I think his sister, and a couple of other family members. But he also went with a guy whose name was Isaac Milner. Now, Isaac Milner was also from Cambridge University. And he, they talked about him at Cambridge University as being incredibly bright. So if people in Cambridge say you're bright, you're a seriously smart guy. And so what William Wilberforce and, and Isaac Milner did in their horse and carriage in their grand tour is they talked. I mean, you think about this. This is the 18th century. No Facebook, no phone. Can you imagine it? Sounds awful, doesn't it? Uh, so he, he, and, and talking to somebody. Who would have thought? Uh, so he's talking the whole way around, and they're discussing a particular book about faith and belief. And as they discuss the book... Wilberforce comes to this point where he believes that Jesus is who he said he was. Uh, Jesus, Jesus has to change my life. I need to give my life into Jesus' hands. And at the end of the holiday, he becomes a Christian and heads back to London. You're probably thinking, and he was excited. Jesus in his heart, spirit on his life. He's looking forward to getting back. This is fantastic. He was totally depressed. Totally depressed. You know why? He thought he'd ruined his life. He'd wasted his life. He'd wasted his education. He'd wasted his time in Parliament. He's wasting his life. Maybe I should leave Parliament and become a, a, a minister of religion. Maybe that's what God wants me to do. And he was really unsure about staying in Parliament. So he went to see the only guy he thought he could talk to, and that was a guy whose name was John Newton. John Newton at that point was an Anglican minister, a very popular preacher in the middle of London. John Newton used to be a slave trader. He ran a, a slave ship. He was a captain of a slave ship in the middle of a storm, comes to faith, uh, followed that through, uh, became a minister, an Anglican minister, and actually wrote the hymn Amazing Grace. So you'll know that. He, John Newton wrote Amazing Grace. The original one, not one with a cool new <laughs> verse, the old one. So he wrote Amazing Grace. So, John, so William Wilberforce goes off to see John Newton. They discuss, and John Newton says to Wilberforce, you're in the right place at the right time. This is your moment. God's placed you right there. This is it for you. And William Wilberforce left John Newton, and you can read about this. He writes about the fact that he felt he had a second chance in life. So this moment that God had called him, and he said he, got, he had two great visions. One was the abolition of slavery, Two was the reformation of manners. Now, that wasn't how you used cutlery. It was the morality of England, which was a very, very immoral place at that time. Apparently, 25% of all girls at 16 that lived in London at that time who were single were prostitutes. This was not a nice place. And William Wilberforce changed the world. But why did he change the world? Because Jesus changed him and called him to free those under the, under the, the, the awful awful pain 
of slavery and being sold as human chattel. You know, Jesus doesn't ask you to come into this room to play the game of church. Jesus asks you to come here and be changed. Jesus wants to change the game. He changed the game in Paul's life. He changed the game in Augustine's life. He's changed that millions, billions of people over the years, and he wants to change you as well. Jesus is the game changer, not just because there's big ideas that have changed. Jesus is the game changer because he changes one person at a time, one life at a time, and they go on to change other people's lives. And whether you do that and become famous or nobody ever hears is completely irrelevant. It doesn't matter, does it? You know, this week, this week, you're where you live, you could be the game changer. Your house, your street, your community, your school, your university, your group of friends, you can change the game. But it starts with Jesus changing you. Something has to happen in your life. And I want to say, I believe this morning, not because John's talked to me and said, I've got to sort these people out, but because I know humanity. (laughs) Humanity says there are people here that need the game changed. There are people here this morning, and it might be you that needs the game changed. Something has to happen in your life. You know you can't keep living the way you are. And this is not about Jesus saying, that's not about me saying to you, you've got to go, and go out there and make all these changes. This is about me having a quiet moment in your ear to say, this could be your moment. Is this your moment? Whether you've been coming to this church or been in life for a very long time or this is very new for you, this could be your moment. God could be speaking to you. And he's saying, I want to change the game. I want you to live in a relationship with me. I want your present to be solidly in a relationship with Jesus. I want you to put the past behind, the stuff that you know shouldn't be a part of your life. I want you to put that behind and I want you to push forward into a relationship with Jesus. And you know what? In the midst of all of that, eternity is waiting as well. Here is the chance to accept Jesus' death and resurrection, life-changing moment in human history and make it personal for you. Because that is the game change that needs to happen. Can I lead you in prayer? Will you join me in prayer? Perhaps if you're in an attitude of prayer. That's not because it's any holier. It just means that you concentrate better. It just means that you're able to focus. So if you're in a... Close your eyes and bow your heads. And just in this moment, is this your moment? Is God speaking to you? Do you need to turn away from a whole bunch of stuff that you know you shouldn't be a part of your life? Do you want the game changed? Do you know that the game needs to change for you and this is your time to make a choice? Because if God is speaking to you, don't pass it up. I want to lead you in a prayer which is simply an opportunity for you to speak to God and perhaps these words will help. This is not about saying this out aloud. This is about talking to your Heavenly Father who hears the attitude of your heart. And if your attitude of your heart is to turn to God in a new, fresh way. Why don't you use this moment to do it? Lord Jesus, I come to you. I'm sorry for how I've lived. I ask for your forgiveness. I pray that your spirit would come into my life. Fill me with your spirit and give me the courage to live what I say I believe. Lord, we all come to you this morning in different levels of faith, commitment, and belief. And Lord, we all need the game changed, either in a new, fresh moment that it may would be for some people today, or a, a reaffirmation of what we know to be true. Lord, we come to you today and we say, change the game in our lives. And Lord, we pray that we'd have the ability to be your people to change the game in our community. And we ask this in Jesus' precious and peerless name. Amen. Thanks, John. Thank you, Carl. And it could have been today that you prayed that prayer. And I'd encourage you to let someone know about that. Just a brief word of testimony here. When I was about 14, I made a public declaration of my faith in Jesus. And... Earlier, I had remembered my father describing to me, which probably you've heard about, this um, complex 
jigsaw puzzle that had the sea and the world and the little boy was asked to put this jigsaw puzzle together. And Dad said, it was so complex that how did you make all the pits where the sea is and the land is make sense? And the little boy gave up, said, I can't do that, I can't change the, get the world together. And uh, the father said to the little boy, there's a secret. You, you turn over the jigsaw puzzle and on the back of the jigsaw puzzle there's a picture of a person, just a single line of a person. You get the person right, you get the world right. And that impacted me very deeply because I was facing the situation about myself being put right with God. And Carl's today spoke to us about the way Jesus changed the world and yet he did it through changing us. So it's a very, very personal call. And uh, if today you had met that call, then I'd love to talk to you. We're having a baptism service in two weeks' time. And it, maybe this is the way you can publicly demonstrate, yes, I have, I have made that decision to follow Jesus. I'm going to show publicly that I'm following him. Would you do that today?